Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 20. Uh, Luke is one of the biographies of Jesus, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, Luke wrote his biography to reassure someone about the truth of Jesus. And in this part, we get the account uh, of the birth of Jesus and what happens on that night. Luke chapter 2, 1 to 20, page 909. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. His first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Saviour was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly... There was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger after seeing them. They reported the message they were told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, every now and again as I'm working on a sermon and there's a phrase that I'm thinking about, I just type it randomly into Google and see how many times that phrase comes up. So this week the phrase was, the wonder of Christmas. The wonder of Christmas. Uh, there are a lot of references to that online. So I suppose I want to ask you the question, what is the wonder of Christmas? Uh, is it the sight of little faces opening presents Presents that they've looked at, touched, and maybe snuck over and had a shake all through the weeks leading up to Christmas. Is that the wonder of Christmas? Is it the warmth of a meal together with family and friends that you've not seen for such a long time? Uh, is it that afternoon period when you can lie down and just have some quietness and reflection considering how good the day has been? Is it the warmth of the Australian summer or the cool of a northern winter snowfall? Is it the ability of humans to commercialise everything, even at Christmas? What's the wonder of Christmas? We're going to look at that now, so let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks uh, for Luke, uh, a doctor who carefully investigated all the accounts of the life of Jesus and write down those words in Luke 2. Thank you that you kept your promise, that you came to earth to make your enemies your people by forgiving their sin. Father, that is wonderful. We pray that you'll apply it to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. At point two on the outline, uh, we're spending the four Sundays of Advent looking at four Christmas carols. Uh, last week we looked at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, it's a slightly different sermon series as we approach Christmas and uh, it's certainly one that stretched me as I've sat down and worked on the sermons and the Bible studies, but it's helpful to think about the things that take up so much of our time as we gather together and that's our singing. I remember last week I reminded us that we're a singing people 
Uh, there's no other group of people that sings like God's people, that does it so regularly, that is defined by singing both at our beginning and at our end. And remember last week I gave us a definition of a song, a truth to music, to stir emotions and invite a response. That's a definition open to debate. And so Stephen and I had a chat after church last week uh, where Stephen suggested a very good alternative. Uh, It's a definition open to debate, but it's also a definition that gives us a bit of structure as we think about our songs, as we consider our singing. It encourages us to think about the truth in a song or whether or not it's even speaking any truth at all. It encourages us to consider our own emotions that a song might stir in us. It's a definition that calls for us to acknowledge that a song always invites a response. Today we're looking at Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let me give you a little bit of the background. Charles Wesley wrote it. Uh, He was walking to church in London on Christmas Day and all the churches in London had their bells ringing. He went home after church and wrote a poem. Uh, The poem was turned into a hymn. It first appeared in public in 1739. He had probably only been a Christian for 12 months. He'd been a minister of an Anglican church for a lot longer. And then he'd become someone who was friends with Jesus. Uh, The hymn went through a number of changes. Uh, The original music was really solemn and somber and slow. Uh, In 1861, a man called William Cummings took a cantata, don't ask me what that is, but I'm told it's a piece of music written by Mendelssohn, took that and applied it to these lyrics. And it brought out a remarkable change. I actually had to rearrange the verses, combine verses, and then create a chorus. It was the last point of a number of changes to the lyrics. The most significant change to the lyrics was by a man called George Whitfield. He was a friend of Wesley and regarded as the greatest public preacher of his time. He took Wesley's original opening line. Here's the original opening line. Think about this. Hark how all the welkin rings, glory to the King of Kings. Well, if you don't know what hark is, it's going to be a struggle to know what welkin is, isn't it? Uh, That just means the heavens. A Whitfield who had an ear for the way in which language worked and words that people could understand changed it into, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. We've got to remember those facts against the backdrop of Wesley's life. Remember, when he heard those bells in London on Christmas Day, he'd only been a Christian for 12 months. Something struck him on that day as he walked away from church and he went home and wrote a poem about it. In fact, the rest of his life in public was about setting truth to music. He wrote 6,000 hymns, more than any other male writer. The female record is 8,000. His intent in his hymn writing was this, to teach the poor and illiterate God's truth. To teach the poor and illiterate God's truth. In fact, his brother, John Wesley, described Charles' hymnal, his hymn book, as the best theological book in existence. So when we sing this song later on in the service, just remember those truths. Written by a man who'd only just become a Christian, who wanted to communicate God's truth to people who had no money and no ability to read. That's the background for this hymn. So we're going to dive into it now in the same way we did last week. We're going to look at the truth and then we're going to look at the emotions and then we're going to look at the response. Uh, The carol itself seems largely formed by the words of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verses 13 to 14. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth to the people he favours. Three verses repeated chorus, and each verse has a separate focus. And there's one line that captures that verse. In the first verse, it's there in the last line. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Now, Christ isn't Jesus' surname. Christ is actually his job description. 
Christ is his job description. It simply means chosen one. It's the bloke God picks to do a job. As that idea developed amongst God's people, it got tangled up with the idea of a king. Did you hear there in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, that the Christ is the boss, the Lord? It also became connected with ideas of salvation. So God chose a bloke to come and rule so God's people could be saved. Saved from their rebellion against God, saved from death, saved from sin, saved from their brokenness, saved from their desperation. And all of those ideas became connected to a certain line of kings. Do you remember last week, 2 Samuel 7, a bloke born in Bethlehem? What was his name again? It was David, wasn't it? The greatest king of God's people. And God said to David one day in 2 Samuel 7, Hey, David, one of your boys, one of your boys is going to be my boy. One of your boys will rule forever in justice and kindness and gentleness and truth. One of your boys is going to be my boy, and as his father, I will punish him. For God's people, that was their great hope. We're going to get a king one day who'll rule us, who'll save us, who'll change us. They understood it in terms of dirt and borders and palaces. And God had something far more powerful going on. And that was the reading that, that Laura brought to us. That idea that people in darkness have seen a great night. And, and we're going to turn to that in the last of the truths. So Christ, uh, he, he came in a town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem was not a thriving metropolis. Uh, it was a very small town, about eight kilometers from Jerusalem. There was really nothing to recommend Bethlehem. Nothing to write home about, nothing where you'd expect something great to come from, it, except David was born in Bethlehem. And that's why a bloke called Micah talked about Bethlehem in such a way that God's people looked forward to it. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you're small among the clans of Judah. That's an understatement. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Therefore, he will abandon them until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh his God. They'll live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. Bethlehem? Really? Nothing comes from Bethlehem. Well, that's the point. Nothing comes from Bethlehem. So don't worry about Bethlehem. Worry about the person who made the promise. <laughs> the town is insignificant. But the bloke who makes the promise is amazing. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Well, that's the other word there, isn't it? Born. We're familiar with that word, aren't we? Born. And we jump over it very quickly, don't we? Born. We know what it means. Christ is born in Bethlehem. We get focused on the Christ and the Bethlehem bit. We forget the born bit. But well, that's actually the amazing bit. It talks about God taking on flesh to be a human being. I want to just say that again. It talks about God taking on flesh to be a human being. Why would God do that? Why would God take on flesh to be a human being? And we'll come to that in a moment. But there's the first truth. Christ is born in Bethlehem. And if you have any doubts about it, just go down to the town hall of Bethlehem and check the birth records. It's verifiable. It's truth. And the Romans were good at keeping records, weren't they? The truth of the second verse picks up on that born idea. It takes a lot of ideas from wider Christian culture, the Nicene Creed, it's there in the end of the Bible study book, it's Philippians 2, 5 to 11 that Phoenix brought us. Uh, it dips into the start of John's good news biography of Jesus and it touches on the idea that God is with us. Hail the incarnate deity. There's a lot of big words there. But at the heart of it is this thing called the incarnation, God putting on flesh to be a human being. It is so important. It is central to the way in which we come back to God. Let me just explain what that means. On the one hand, we need someone just like us, don't we? 
We need someone just like us who'll go into bat for us. He'll stand in for us. He'll defend us, but without sin. Remember Isaiah 53, 5 to 6 last week? We need someone who is human in every way like us who can stand in for us. On the other hand, we need God himself to come and do something about our sin because God himself is the one we sinned against. If God is wronged, he himself has to come and bring us back to him, forgive us. That's the incarnation. We need a human and we need God. Just think about how you deal with conflict. Imagine that someone has wronged you grievously in a way that turns you into each other's enemies. How do you deal with that? Well, if you're anything like me, they've got to make the first move. They're the ones that wronged me. They're the ones that have got to take the initiative. That's not what happens at the incarnation, is it? At the heart of the incarnation is humility, where the one who has been sinned against goes to find his enemies and bring them back to him. That was why we had that reading from Philippians chapter 2. It expresses what God does. Let me read it again. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he'd come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him, gave him the name that is above every name. So at the the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God doesn't have humility imposed on him. He actually takes pleasure, you'll notice, in the hymn. It pleases him. He doesn't use his godness for his own advantage. Did you notice that? Here is the creator of the universe, the one whose image we bear. We have rebelled against him. He is well within his rights to wipe us out. And what does he do? I'll go and be a human so that I can make my enemies my friends. That's the kind of king we need, isn't it? Can you imagine that kind of political leader? (laughs) One who goes, it's not about my rights, but about your needs. One who puts aside his own rights in order to consider the needs of his own enemies. One who serves those he rules. One who considers the needs of others greater than his own. One, One who takes the greatest pleasure in putting aside his own bigness in order to save his enemies. That's the second truth, the incarnate deity. Uh, The third truth is captured in that line in the third verse, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Uh, When Christ is born in Bethlehem, when God is humble and puts on flesh and comes as a human, what does he achieve? He achieves peace. And if you look through that third verse, the whole package is laid out. The one that humans need is heaven born, he's God. The one humans need is born, he takes on flesh. The one that humans need that lays his glory by, he puts his bigness on the side and comes to his enemies. The one humans need comes to the sons of earth, he steps into our world. The one humans need is risen with healing in his wings. To rise, you've got to die, and to die, you've got to be alive. And the one human's need achieves everything that humans need. He brings light and life. He brings healing. He brings second birth. He brings a future where man no more may die. It's expressed in that magnificent prophecy that we heard earlier on from Isaiah 9. For a child will be born for us, A son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
The dominion will be vast. Its prosperity will never end. He'll reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And if you remember, as Laura began that reading, that's the moment that light comes to darkness. Here are the three packages of truth, all summarised in a phrase from each verse. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hail the incarnate deity. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. So let me ask you a question. What are the emotions that you might feel hearing those truths? What are the emotions that you might feel? I'm going to give you 60 seconds just to think on that. What emotions are stirred by those three truths? And then I'll suggest a few for you. Take a moment. You'll see on your outline there that I've suggested four that were stirred in me and I think perhaps the first emotion that this song wants to stir is the emotion of wonder. I want you to consider again what happened there in Luke 2. Put yourself in the sandals of the shepherds. You're out in the fields. The sheep are okay. And then what appears in the sky? A whole stack of angels. I want you to consider how you then run to Bethlehem and you find everything just as you were told. I want you to consider a child born who is God himself who will bring peace that covers the whole earth. Do you reckon they ever said that of King Charles at his birth? I want you to consider again the type of God unlike any God that we can imagine, who as part of his very nature puts aside his power and comes to find his enemies. I want you to consider again the amazing event of an incarnation. Second emotion would be, I don't even know if it's an emotion or a virtue, humility. Now, it's front and centre there as we think about God. And God himself wants to stir humility in ourselves. After all, who wouldn't want to follow a king who says, I'm about your needs? Who wouldn't want to follow a king who hops off his throne and puts on the uniform of his enemies so they can be his friends? Who wouldn't want to follow a king who does humility like that? Is there any other ruler like that in the whole world? Who wouldn't want to follow a king who says in Mark 10, 45, I've not come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. What other king, what other way of life actually forgets about rights and talks about needs? What other king doesn't trumpet his rights but who kneels and deals with his enemy's needs. What other king achieves such peace? Perhaps the third emotion is the emotion of joy. (laughs) I think many of us are worn out, aren't we? I think many of us look at the week ahead and it looks pretty grey. I think many of us look at the week behind us and want to have a delete button. But a song like this wants to stir joy. Christ is born in Bethlehem. God and sinners reconciled. I've never experienced the end of a war. I think it must be so good, so good to hear about peace. That's a famous picture. (laughs) I think that's the picture of Hark the Herald Angels Sing as we move into next week. 
a man who dances in the street with no inhibition because there is now peace. And it just bubbles over. Uh, Look at the people around him. Look at that woman looking over her shoulder. Look at the two soldiers watching this bloke as he tap dances down the street. And as you look at that song, it infects the whole world. All the nations, not just the winning nations, all the nations will one day be ruled by this unique king who is so humble that he puts aside his rights and deals with our needs. And a huge celestial choir breaks out and sings to shepherds. And when the shepherds go and see, remember from Luke 2, they ran about afterwards saying, look at what we've seen. They couldn't shut up. Can you imagine the doors they knocked on in Bethlehem in the wee hours of the morning? And then that joy moves to worship. That's the fourth emotion. Worship that says, have you met Jesus and seen what type of king he is? That's why the song keeps on saying, hail, hail, hail. Come and have a look. Come and have a look. And that's why when the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they'd seen and heard, just as they've been told, they're doing worship and saying, look at God. How good is he? So there are some of the emotions that might be stirred. Well, what's your response? Well, let me rephrase that. What's the wonder of Christmas? What's the wonder of Christmas? What provokes your wonder at Christmas? Is it the incarnation and the goodness of God putting aside his bigness for his enemies? Is the wonder of Christmas that Charles Wesley could turn his talents to teach illiterate and poor people such goodness? Are you taught by such a song? Is the wonder of Christmas the joy that bubbles up in you so that you dance into the week ahead because you have met the truth that God took on flesh to give you peace? Is the wonder of Christmas that you knock on doors and share with everyone you meet? Have you met Jesus, born in Bethlehem? who has come to bring us peace, is the wonder of Christmas the fact that Jesus is king and deserves all the glory. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Charles Wesley for his ability with music and words uh, to put together truths from all over the Bible into a song that stirs wonder at you putting on flesh to come and find your enemies. Please stir in us that wonder, that joy, that humility, that giving you what you deserve because of what you have done. Father, we pray that in the week ahead uh, we will know that joy, the joy of a peace that conquers death, the joy of a king who's come to save his enemies, the joy of Christmas that we must share with others. Father, thank you for Christ who is born in Bethlehem. Amen.